Next, remembering some momentous events in Franklin Park. Then, Chinese food and its early roots in Columbus. And later, where exactly is Baby Farms? Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by American Electric Power is proud to sponsor WOSU Public Media Columbus Neighborhoods. Working together with our communities, we're committed to powering a bright, boundless future for us all. At Ohio Health, we believe it's important to have a healthy understanding of the world around you. That's why we're proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media and their work to educate, entertain, and inspire the people we serve. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Countless places, buildings, stores, restaurants, you name it, have all come in and out of central Ohio over the last 200 years. Some we remember, and some have faded into time. This episode is dedicated to keeping some of those places and their history alive. And if you've lived in Columbus as long as I have, I'm sure you recognize the building behind me. Every year, tens of thousands of people come to Franklin Park Conservatory, just east of downtown, to enjoy its gardens and acres of green space. And there are some interesting events that have happened here over the years that you may or may not have heard about. Take a look. Franklin Park, which had originally been set up as the home of the Franklin County Agricultural Society, later will become the state fairgrounds and then a public park. At the end of the Victorian era, there was a city beautiful movement, and it was a movement to beautify cities and urban areas by creating parks. And so Columbus instituted several parks throughout the entire metropolitan area, including Franklin Park. The historic John F. Wolf Palm House was constructed in 1895, and it was inspired by the buildings at the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. It was reputed originally to have been brought down here how one does not know from the Columbian Exposition. In fact, it wasn't, it was built here. The features were a beautiful lake, which is west of the Palm House, where we have the Mallway today. And then there's a 1.2 mile walking path that people use today for exercise and walking their dogs. And that was actually a driving track. So people came down for a leisurely drive and there was also automobile racing. And since then, the park has been a popular destination. In 1992, the city decides for the 500th anniversary celebration of Christopher Columbus landing in the New World, and we are the largest city in the nation named for Christopher Columbus, that they're going to invite this large floral exhibit to come here called Ameriflora. It was the first horticulturally themed exposition in North America, and the goal was to bring people here from all over the United States and beyond to view displays that were typical of all of the major cultures in the world. The historic Palm House was renovated for Ameriflora and a $14 million expansion was undertaken to create numerous new structures to house exotic biomes. So we built uh, the Himalayan biome, a rainforest, a desert, and a Pacific Island water garden, which are still here today. And then the park, all 88 acres, were part of the Ameriflora Festival. Amira Flores' vision, I think, was to be a very, very grand event. President and First Lady Barbara Bush came to kick it off, and it saw over two million people in attendance, so it was, it was huge. Amira Flora brought with it a lot of excitement and a lot of people to our community. It brought some money to rehab the houses around the park. It gave us a place in national history because it was so famous for a short period of time. So they closed the park for an entire year, 1991. 
off from the community, put a fence up, tell the entire community you can't go there, you can't use the park anymore. And then in 1992, they open it back up, but they charge admission to everybody because it's now this large ex exhibition space. It was really hard that it was fenced off for a while. It was the community's park and they couldn't walk in it without paying to get in it. So um, there, there was a lot of controversy around it during the time it was Ameriflora. I remember a family that we knew well were just really adamantly against the park being used for Ameriflora. My mother was on a committee for it and her perspective was it was going to make a big difference for the community. So I think that those two views of two people who were neighbors and who knew each other well it sort of epitomizes the conflict and many people did feel that they were being marginalized. That was the beginning of more attention that was more vocal and that you could uh, see uh, a lot of the energy and the resentment of uh, persons in terms of how that was handled. I think the people who were planning it might have been a little surprised by that, but conservatory staff actually went out into the neighborhoods and talked with everyone and assured them that it was still their park and then even did landscaping in the yards of all of the houses surrounding the park. Really through time what I have discovered is things do really work themselves out. Communities do really come together. Well, I think Ameriflora probably has mixed reviews in terms of its success. But I think in hindsight, it was calling attention to a park that had long been neglected. People became aware that the neighborhood really was uh, quite nice. Some of the good things that did come out of it when they added all of the different biospheres around it. And it also cleaned up the park a little bit because they added the waterfalls and, and the pergolas and the mallway garden. And the conservatory got a kickstart at that point. After Ameriflora was over, the conservatory staff continued to go out into the neighborhoods and talk with people and build friendships. And that actually became the very beginning of what has grown into a very vibrant community gardening program called Growing to Green. And over the years since, the conservatory has helped to found and help thrive over 200 community gardens. So I think it was the, the mending fences and the rebuilding of the relationships here locally around the park that taught us that that relationship and that sharing of expertise was really important to our neighbors and that it became really impactful. It's a fabulous asset for those of us who live here. It's beautiful, it's essentially safe, it's well cared for, and the neighborhood looks out for it. It is a true urban park, and the conservatory has kept it going and kept it beautiful and made it kind of a jewel in the city of Columbus. Next, Chinese food and its early roots in Columbus. Then, how a neighborhood was created around many farms. As Columbus grows, we're starting to see more and more restaurants pop up with new types of cuisines from all over the world. My personal favorite right now is El Adapaso, but Chinese restaurants have been around since the 1800s, and one of the very first, the Far East Restaurant. Charlene visits with one of the descendants to talk about their story. Today I'm at Wings Restaurant, located on East Main Street in Bexley. Owner Ken Yi serves favorite Chinese dishes, including meat and veggie stir fries, spicy noodles, and even that grand old standby, egg foo young. The building has long been a center of the Columbus Chinese American community. It was best known in the 1940s as the Far East Restaurant. But the history of the Far East goes back even further to when it first opened around the 1930s, right down the street. Oh my goodness, thank you. I've invited Helen Yi and her cousin Irene Barnett here for lunch to learn more about the Far East Restaurant and their family's history. So your great-great-grandfather 
was the first one in the family to come over to the United States. Yes. Where did he wind up settling and what did he do? My great, great grandfather actually came here in 1885. He settled in California, in San Francisco, and he actually worked on the railroads. And he also had another job where he was um, uh, doing something with the market. And one day, they actually had him go deliver some potato sacks. And something happened where the potato sack fell off of the wagon, and he jumped off the, the wagon to go ahead and pick up the potatoes that were running around all over the place. Mm -hmm. And the horse got startled, and so it trampled over him and he died. My gosh, he comes yeah. over for a new life and he winds up getting killed on his job. Exactly. My grandfather, George, had to take the body back over to China because that's part of the Chinese custom. Yes. But then he returned and was able to immigrate to Columbus, Ohio. Did he decide to come over because he liked what he saw when he was here to, you know, bring home your great-great-grandfather? Yeah, you know, it was more like a America is the land of opportunity. Still, same, Still same to right now. I mean, if you if you say let's go to America, I think everybody would say, yeah, let's go, let's go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a better better life, better life. more opportunities, yeah. Yeah. jobs, yeah. make a living more easily yeah. than where he was. What's funny is my grandfather never wanted to do the hard labor, like working on a railroad. So his dad actually told him. Well, you should probably, you know, with your handsome looks <laughs> and your education of knowing English really well, um, maybe you should get into the restaurant business, like being a waiter. And so that's what he did. And he actually saved enough money to start his own restaurant. Probably around 1930s, him and his business partner opened the first Far East restaurant, which I actually have a picture of right there. That was the original Far East restaurant. Now, where was this located? This was on Main Street. And then maybe about 10 years later, they moved to this location. This must have been a really strange cuisine for people at that time, especially in Columbus, Ohio, who ate Chinese food back then. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, everything was shipped from San Francisco, you know, things like bean sprouts and water chestnuts. Pea pods. Pea pods, yeah these, yeah, these were all unusual food that you would not find in Columbus, Ohio. Apparently it caught on. People must have liked it. I mean, they were drawn to the restaurants. Oh, yeah. There would be lines out the door. My grandfather, he was very good with people. And so a lot of times, like in China, he would build these relationships where people like um, Irene's dad wanted to work for him. And he came over and actually sponsored the family, mm -hmm. her family. Yep. Her grandfather is my great, great uncle. And my grandmother just thought, you know, hey, this I know a relative in Columbus, Ohio, you know. <laughs> Let okay. me contact him and see if, you know, he can sponsor you and you can go over there. That's Pretty the way much. it worked. If you had one person who was here, right. somebody yeah. had to get the ball rolling, yeah. Yeah. come over, work hard, get things started, mm -hmm. and then gradually start helping other members of the family or yes, friends yes, get yes, over yes, here. Yes, yes. They had to be adventurous and, and to yes, come this far. Yes, because it's a huge risk of not knowing what you're going into, and I love that pioneering spirit, mm -hmm. but because of George saying, and the family, and your mama saying, yes, we will take on these relatives that I hardly know. <laughs> We're related to them, but fine. You know, and that's a good point. You have to be incredibly generous, too. Mm -hmm to take in family and friends and whoever else was coming yep. over. Was that a cultural thing, a family thing, an individual thing? I think it's a cultural thing. I do too. And actually it's very much Chinese to make your fortune and send it home, same idea. Mm -hmm. Why restaurants? Yeah. What is it about a restaurant that seemed so promising to them? I think the uniqueness of the food, so the different taste in, in different types of dishes. Yeah, you know, sharing a meal, I think there is a, something very um, human about that that mm -hmm. could transcend culture. Yeah. You know, I might not speak your language, but that tastes good, so we're, you know, we're smiling yes, and we're talking. Right. Yeah, because when you, when you break bread together, mm -hmm. that breaks down barriers, right. I think, right, right. there. Oh, absolutely. When you share a meal, I mean, it's hard to stay mad at somebody, especially if, they're, you know, you're <laughs> having good food. Right, mm -hmm. and this is probably a very similar menu. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, this is Warsugai, Egg Fu Yang. American Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> American Chinese, right. 
So they cater to the taste of what Americans would enjoy eating. Mm -hmm. They would make the traditional, authentic Chinese food for all the staff and the employees because mm -hmm. we were all Chinese, but not have it served to any of the customers. Right. And it wasn't on the menu. And again, and I think adapting menus to your, your liking is another way of, of being very uh, accommodating. But I see something trending like nowadays where mm -hmm. more people are wanting the authentic Chinese menu. Before yes. it would be, we would be given the authentic Chinese menus, but if we had friends that were American, they would just get the American Chinese menu. After he and the rest of your family have run these restaurants mm -hmm. and been very successful at it, all this time. What, what's the legacy from that? My grandfather, him and his business partner, were in business for like 40 some years and they did really well until they decided to split and my grandfather started a restaurant on Broad Street which was called the Yee's Restaurant mm -hmm. and then the Far East, which is this building, became Wings. And here we are eating at it today. Yep. That amazes me that <laughs> exactly. this, this building is actually a historic building. Mm -hmm. And it's part of your family's history. Yeah. Growing up as kids, we were taken to the restaurant every night because mm -hmm. our parents would work like long hours. And it filtered to me how hard my parents and how hard my grandparents worked mm -hmm. to really provide for the family, send money over. And my own personal legacy of, of my grandfather we call yeah yeah he never spoke to me about business but he was such a great example his interactions with people were just very authentic very transparent he was a funny man that goes a long way for any where whatever you're doing in life i would not be here today if her grandfather did not say yes go ahead and come over i really didn't know Georgie until I came over, but I'm so forever grateful for him for saying yes. I have so enjoyed talking to you both oh, and learning about fun. your family. Yeah. I've learned a whole bunch about food. <laughs> now I know. I've been fooled all this time, but it's still good. Thank, thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. There are well over 100 neighborhoods in central Ohio, some officially named and some not. Some you definitely recognize and some you've never heard of. One of those lesser known neighborhoods was started in the 1920s when lots were marketed as mini farms. Local historian Doreen Uhouse Sauer checks it out. Today I'm in an area called Baby Farms located east of I-71 and just south of Morris Road. Here I ran into my old friend Tracy Garber who wanted to know a little bit more about the history of his neighborhood. In a city of subdivisions and more subdivisions, I think what is special about Baby Farm is that not only does it have a unique history, but we're able to match the history with an actual real estate brochure, with an actual transportation map. Indianola is, and the rail line is coming up this way and it's coming up, and Morris Road, which is actually Rathbone on the other side, is sort of like the new place to live. And if you look at all this open space, these are still farms all around here in 20s. There are huge tracts of land owned by mortgage companies already um, because they know which way the wind is blowing. They're gonna subdivide, but your streets are already laid out in 27. We found an old real estate brochure, and I think that's what started the hunt to find out more about the neighborhood was this unusual brochure that starts with the baby farm and little kid eating a watermelon and all of the copy that talks about how the city is growing north, and it's growing north because um, it, of the inner urban lines. The brochure talks about following the fresh air up north and uh, Baby Farms Appeal, there were 181 lots, I think, originally, was that you could have your own little stake of ground to, and essentially doing truck farming. So you've got one, two, three, or four lots. Most people had four city lots. And there was no zoning. There was nothing that they had to conform to. So they would have this big opening up here and you could come and look at the lots. You could choose the one that you wanted. They were gonna make it very economical for you. 
probably the most arresting part of it, in addition to all the graphics, is this little square here that says free sugar. We will give absolutely free a two pound carton of pure cane sugar to every white adult who visits Baby Farm Sunday, April 30th, and registers his or her name and address. We expect each spoonful of this sugar to remind you of the sweet, pure air and the sweeter music of the birds on our baby farms. Or reminds you of segregation, which, <laughs> whichever comes yes. first. But what's interesting about this is that we forget that as the city was expanding in the 20s, and the 20s are a high period of de facto segregation. And so anything that was touched by a streetcar line, Linden, the near west side, the, the hilltop, this neighborhood would have had, in a way, the rumblings of a gated community. They're not saying you can't buy here, but boy, they're pretty sure about who they're yeah. targeting. Yeah. yeah. Yes, they are. The houses, for the most part, yours came in late 50s, early 60s? Yes. I'm the third owner. I was told it was uh, built by an OSU professor. What do you love about your house? It's a uh, very open plan, very modern. The windows front and back. I can see right through it. It's like living uh, outside. Do you have a lot of the original fixtures inside? I have a few. <laughs> I actually have the, the original stove and uh, cooktop. I have all the uh, original kitchen cabinets. Did you do all the unusual landscaping? Uh, yeah, yes, I have. I did construction, so every time we dug a new foundation, uh, the backhoe operator became my best friend and he would load up rocks for me. All the houses in the neighborhood seem to be slightly different, although there are some split levels and some little cottages. Yours certainly stands out as the most unusual. Is the color scheme the original one when you bought the house, or uh, was it your design? No, that was my design. And why pink and blue? It's perfect. Uh, <laughs> I thought it spoke to the house. Uh, it said it wanted to be pink and blue, and I love pink. So. They're very 50s colors, so that kind of works out very well. Yes, and I was told it looked like a um, Miami home. Oh, yeah, kind or, of a little bit Art Deco or, Miami color. Right. Some of my neighbors didn't quite like it at first, but they grew to love it. Oh, yeah. Or at least I hope so. <laughs> As I traveled around the neighborhood, I discovered a property with a huge garden. The owner is Milan Karcic, who operates Peace, Love, and Freedom Farm. Why did you buy out here? And did you know that you were buying in an area called Baby Farm? We were looking for a home with a lot of space, mm -hmm. and my wife found this spot Mm -hmm. and we fell in love with it. We found it was a perfect blend between the city and the country. We didn't know much about it besides it was called Baby Farms. Never questioned that odd name. That came with time. Oh, okay. <laughs> we just fell in love with it because we knew we were going to start a baby farm. What other stories have you heard about the neighborhood and its history? We had an, uh, an an OSU professor who was a botanist. He was always doing experiments with plants. He lived okay. on this road. Um, the building behind us was built in the Great Depression as a source of income and a way to feed families. It's a chicken coop and it's an enormous building and you could have a lot of chickens in there. We have some old timers here that have been here since, you know, since they were kids and they saw this neighborhood change and they were here when it was just farmland. Our garden specifically mm -hmm. was sweet corn and strawberries. So tell me what is your operation here? We're a certified organic farm. Mm -hmm. The total acreage of our garden is just over a quarter of an acre. Our customers are the refractory restaurant. I sell at the Clintonville Farmers Market every Saturday. Without them I would have gone out of business and I have 20 families this year that I'm feeding as well every week during a we call it a CSA, where every week we deliver a bag of produce to their door. This represents how many years of development? This is our fourth season here. Okay. We started small with maybe, you know, one row or two rows, I think it was the first year of beds. Right. Every year we expand a little more. We're trying to hire somebody to help with the workload. Okay. Because I'm, I'm trying to balance my workload and my family life. That's an issue that I think a lot of farmers or gardeners have is right. the amount of work that it is. It's wonderful that the name has come back to actually do what it was set out to do. Because <laughs> you were the end of a streetcar line or the inner urban and this was the place that you could feed a family and you could do it, um, you know, economically and you're doing it. In fact, you're feeding 20 families and your own. What a great story. It's an honor.
Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. I faded out The glass was painted so thin Fortunes fill the hands of only the special blowing in the wind, leaving us to find an image on my wall, frozen there in fear. A light may shine, but not see now. It's pretty dark. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by American Electric Power is proud to sponsor WOSU Public Media Columbus Neighborhoods. Working together with our communities, we're committed to powering a bright, boundless future for us all. At Ohio Health, we believe it's important to have a healthy understanding of the world around you. That's why we're proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media and their work to educate, entertain, and inspire the people we serve. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. And by viewers like you. Thank you.